Hello, my name is Nathan. My name is Nathan. That's Ruben. And I'm Esther. Hello, this is Emmanuel. I just wanted to offer you a very special warm welcome for joining us uh, this morning from wherever you are. Uh, we're really so glad that you could be part of this. Um, before we get into a time of worship uh, and, and prayer and listening to the Word, I'm just going to read a, a quick psalm that I think will speak to us in this um, moment. It's from Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, and it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It's just going to say a quick word of prayer before I will proceed. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have of gathering together, albeit in our, um, different homes or different places wherever we are. But Lord, we believe that your presence is with us. And we pray, Lord, this morning that we will hear your heart. And as we praise and worship, that indeed our worship and praise, Lord, will be um, acceptable and pleasing in your in your sight, Lord, and that your name shall be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing okay. We're going to be starting our time together this morning with a fantastic all-age song. It's got great words, it's got great actions, and it's great truth to remind ourselves of at this moment in time. So join in from wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing the videos of you all dancing along that will appear <laughs> shortly. Yeah, great. One, two, one, two, three. Our God, our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand. He's higher than a skyscraper, and He's deeper than a submarine. Wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams And He's known me and He's loved me since before the world began How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God And He holds us in His hand our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. He's higher. He's higher than a skyscraper, and He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe, and beyond my wildest dreams. And He's known me, and He's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful! Part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Oh, well done, everyone. Uh, we're now um, going to go and uh, see some slides of the pictures and things that the uh, young people have made um, to do with the resurrection. That was our theme this week, so enjoy having a look at those, and we will too.
everybody and welcome to the Peter Quiz. How well do you know Peter? Look at those awesome graphics. Okay, so what Peter are we having a quiz about today? Maybe Peter Pan? No. Maybe Peter Kay? No. Maybe Peter Parker? No. Peter Crouch? No. Peter Rabbit! No. What Peter could we have be having a quiz about? What Peter have we been hearing about for the past few weeks? <sighs> Peter the Apostle! Ding, ding, ding! Correct! Okay, are you ready? We are going to have a quiz about Peter from the Bible. How well do you know Peter? Let's go. Question one. Are you ready? What was Peter's job? Hmm. Now, this one's quite an easy one, I think, but the answer will be appearing on the screen very shortly. Keep your eye out. This is a nice big clue to Peter's job. Hooray! Yes, of course, he was a fisherman. Next question. You are on a roll. How many times was Peter rescued by an angel from prison? So comment in the chat and we'll see if you are right the answer is going to appear on the screen do, 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 do. two peter was rescued from prison by an angel two times that's right hooray question three keep going where was peter's hometown Have you guessed it yet? It's a tricky one. I'm not going to lie. It is a tricky one. The answer is appearing on the screen now. It was, of course, Beth Seda. <laughs> Amazing. That's right. Question four. You are doing great. Which king had Peter arrested? Now, this one's got another clue that may or may not be helpful. It's appearing on the screen now. King Herod. Herod had Peter arrested. So I, I understand that the heron might not have been helpful then, but if you said heron with a cold, it would sound like Herod, Herod. See, I'm doing my best here. Okay, question five. We are halfway through the best quiz ever on this Sunday morning. What did Peter, James and John witness on a mountain? I think this one's quite an easy one again. Who is the first to comment? Let's have a look. It was, of course, Transfiguration. Well done, whoever got that right. Question six, keep going everyone. What animal did Peter find with a coin in its mouth? Which animal? Let's have a look. What animal is that? Any guesses, anybody? Oh, a fish. I did my research, that's right. Question seven, don't give up now. We're nearly there. Which female disciple did Peter raise from the dead? Which female disciple did Peter raise from the dead? Have a comment if you think you know. The answer is Tabitha. Did anybody get it? Mm. Question eight. We're nearly there. Which prophet did Peter quote on the day of Pentecost? Which prophet did Peter quote on the day of Pentecost? Any guesses? Comment in the chat. Who knows what it is? It's Joel. That is the answer. Whoever got that right, congratulations. Question nine. How many chapters are in one and two Peter combined? That's one Peter and two Peter together. How many chapters have we got? Don't be cheating and looking at your Bibles now. Have a guess. The answer was, of course, eight chapters in one and two Peter combined. Woo! -hoo! Question 10, the final question of the Peter quiz. Which relative of Peter did Jesus heal from a fever? Which relative?
It was the mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus healed from a fever. Well, give yourselves a massive round of applause. That was a great job. Thank you for taking part in the Peter quiz. Let's see what's happening next. Bye. Hello. We'd like to read a short passage from 1 Peter chapter 5. Ukuście się pod mocną ręką Bożą, aby was wywyższył czasu swego. Wszelką troską swoją złóżcie na niego, gdyż on ma o was staranie. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Résistez-lui en demeurant ferme dans votre foi, car vous savez que vos frères dispersés à travers le monde and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Yeah, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it teaches about you. Lord, we thank you that you are with us this morning. We thank you for your presence. Lord, thank you for um, how amazing God you are. How great you are, Lord. How great you are. We're going to sing uh, How Great Thou Art Now just reflects on the majesty of God and his glory and yet how a God so high and a God so glorious would come and die in our place.
sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross my burden gladly bearing He bled and died to take away my sin Then sings my soul God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. This I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I.
tread I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold my sin song now that declares God's goodness. It declares that God will never let us down, even through the darkest valleys, even through the biggest storms, even through the biggest challenges that we face. And lots of us are facing those challenges right now. And as we sing this song together this morning, um, let it encourage our hearts, let it encourage our souls, let it tell our hearts and our souls that God is good, God is unchanging. Um, this situation is not good, <laughs> this situation is hard and dark and at times feels really hopeless. But God is unchanging, God is good and God is never going to let us down. So let's sing this and let's declare this as a church family together this morning. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside these sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my son let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my
let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let Lord, we say that you are good. Lord, we declare that you are good. In every situation, Lord, you are good. In every circumstance, Lord, you are good. What a privilege and a joy it is to know you, Lord, to know your goodness. Thank you, Lord. Hi everyone, I'm Andy Pearsons. I'm the assistant pastor here at Elam Huddersfield. If it's your first time tuning in to watch one of our online services, I'd like to give you a really warm welcome. I hope you've been enjoying all that you've seen so far and you'll continue to engage uh, all that we're doing as we continue this morning. Uh, you find us at the end of a series that we've been looking at it's called Stand Firm in God's Grace. Uh, we've been looking at the letter of 1 Peter a letter that uh, the apostle, the disciple Peter wrote to some Christians in what was Asia Minor, that now is modern day Turkey, to encourage them, to lift them up, to challenge them and stir them on, to keep on following after Jesus, because life was getting pretty hard for them. Um, in much the same way as when I used to write letters to uh, my girlfriend, now wife, Jen, I would make sure at the end of the letter, I would stay, uh, save up all the stuff I would want her to remember, just how much I loved her, just how beautiful I thought she was, how devoted I was to her. So she'd remember those things, because quite often, same thing with often with when people preach, you might remember the things near the end, the points that have been wrapped up so you can remember them and you can take them home with you. You may not remember what was said at the beginning, but hopefully you will remember what I say today. So Peter's kind of doing that. He's keeping his most important points, so the things that he wants to make sure the readers remember right at the end, 
to encourage them, challenge them, and stir them, stir them up as they go along. So what we get here uh, in these verses that we're going to look at, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, 6 to 11. We almost get it like a nutshell of what it is to follow after Jesus Christ. You could take these points that I'm going to go through this morning and you could look at them and you could say, this is what it is to follow Jesus. So maybe you've wondered, what, it, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean when someone says they follow Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, these things we're going to look at this morning one by one. And I won't be very long this morning. only going to be a short talk. But these things really represent what it is to be a Christian and to know and love Jesus Christ. See, the first thing that Peter talks about is humility. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. You see, earlier on in this letter, Peter had said, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, in light of God's opposition to pride, Peter now tells his reader, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And at the proper time, he may exalt you. You know, Peter is writing here of a quality that you might rarely see today, but it's a wonderful mark of a heart that's been transformed by Jesus, by a heart that truly trusts Jesus and truly trusts their God. You know, they embrace the suffering that God wills for them because they know that same God also wills their exaltation. They can humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing that that is where the safest place is possible to be. One commentator writes, The God who delivered Israel out of Egypt and who raised the Lord Jesus from the grave with a mighty hand is able to deliver us as we suffer. There is no safe place in the universe to be. There is no safer place in the universe to be than under his mighty hand. And when Jesus is revealed, that will be the only safe place to be. So you might ask yourself, well, humble yourself. What does it mean to humble yourself under God's mighty hand? This is what I think. I think it is to wake up every day, take a deep breath in and know within your mind and within your heart that I am in total dependence upon God's grace and mercy today that the things that i have lined up the things that i have to do i can't do them in my own strength i can only do them with god's grace with his help with his blessing with his guidance i'm depending on him i'm not thinking much of myself i'm thinking much of my god whatever i'm facing he will get me through it a book i read often is the valley of vision uh, which is a collection of prayers uh, which are filled, I wrote this, which are filled with God is God and I am not humbling. Lift your eyes to Jesus. Praise him through this difficult time kind of words. And I highly recommend it to you, the value of vision. And it keeps me humble and it keeps me seeing God where he should be, on his throne, mighty and in charge. You see, we must remind ourselves that even when we humble ourselves before God, it is a safe place to be under his caring hand. Which leads us to the next verse, verse 7, which says, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. In that humility, me knowing that God is all-powerful and I need his help, well, then I can cast my anxieties on him because He cares for me. And I'm passionate about young people understanding and grasping what this verse means. My uh, daughter, Eleanor, who's uh, three, nearly four, absolutely staggered me and Jen uh, a couple of days ago. Um, She was talking to Jen and she said to her, "Uh, Mummy, can I pray about the school um, that I want to get into? Probably not in as salient a sentence as that, but she said, can I pray about school? Uh, we've been waiting to find out what school Eleanor's going to get into. And Jen obviously said, yes, of course you can, of course you can. And she said this really simple prayer. She said, I'm going to pray to the Lord in the roof. I'm like, yep, that might not be as theologically correct. I don't know if God is in my roof, but it was wonderful. That's her understanding. And she prayed and she said, and she said Lord, she said, Lord, um, I'd like to get into school. And then she said to, to Jen, she said, oh, I don't think he answered. And Jen said, well, you know, sometimes you don't always get an immediate answer. And then Eleanor said, oh, well, I'll ask again. Asked again. Then she said, I think God said yes. 
Jen console, stopped crying her eyes out of joy and out of just amazement but, and uh, got us all together and, uh, and said, to, said to Eleanor, that's absolutely wonderful. And we found out uh, just today that she's gone to the school that we wanted to get into and that was a lot of a great time of praise. I don't tell you that because um, just for a, a story, I tell you as an example of when we're super young, we might know exactly where we need to go with our anxieties and our worries. Hopefully as a child, you could run to your mum and dad. Well. Praise God, Eleanor is starting to understand that she can also go to her Father in heaven and ask for help. And this is the case here. He says, cast all your anxieties on him. Being a Christian is about humbling yourself before God. Being a Christian is about praying and casting all your anxieties on a God that you know loves you dearly. John Piper has this great quote. And this is the kind of quote that I think we should you turn into a poster and stick in your living room or your bathroom, your toilet, I don't know, wherever you might go where you worry the most. He says, we know what to do when we don't know what to do. We pray. We know what to do when we don't know what to do. We pray. I think that's a wonderful quote, one hopefully that will stay with you. Stick it on a poster, put it up somewhere, write it on a note, stick it somewhere that you could remember that. So we humble ourselves. We speak to our loving Father in heaven. The next thing that Peter goes on to is verse, verse 8. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Peter earlier in his letter had warned his readers that because the end is at hand, we ought to keep our heads about us and think soberly in chapter 4. He states this again, and then he adds, be watchful, be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. An adversary is defined as someone, a person who might put a charge against you, an accusation against you. See, the devil and all of his demons desire nothing more than to devour your faith. So you think less of your loving God to doubt his care for you, that he doesn't love you as much as you know that he does. To question his very word, just like in the Garden of Eden, Eden, where they doubted what God had told them clearly. They doubted his word. He wants you to doubt the sufficiency of his sacrifice, that Jesus has totally dealt with all the sin in your life on the cross. He has taken the punishment that you deserved. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He wants you to doubt that. He wants to slow you down in this race of faith. He wants to make you think you have no weapons to fight with. This is why he tells us to remain watchful. He wants you to think you're defenseless in this great fight when we have a great defender. He wants to make you feel you're not a child of the king. To lure you into lazy, unalert, plodding along as if you aren't a vital part of God's plan and his plan for the advancement of this kingdom on this earth. C.S. Lewis wrote, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Don't forget, he who is in us is greater than he who prowls around us. He is greater who is in us than he who prowls around us. You might feel surrounded, but don't doubt for a second, friends. The lengths a father will go to protect his children. Be watchful. Make sure that you are aware of what's going on. Asking God for wisdom and insight into the circumstances that are around you. Don't just plod along in life thinking that you're not an enemy of the devil. Don't just think that you're not on his hit list, that he doesn't want to discourage you, doesn't want to slow you down, doesn't want to quench your faith and the Holy Spirit that was within you, with entanglement, within sin and temptation. Now, friends, he takes you seriously, very seriously. And as C.S. Lewis says, we don't want to overstate the devil's power, but we don't want to understate it either. We are at war, but we must remember the weapons that God has given us and the fact that he is our great defender. But let's call upon him for protection and for watchfulness so that my eyes might be alert and, and clearly see all that's going on around us. He says, resist him. He says, be watchful. And he says, resist him, firm in your faith. He's not 
taking us out of the game here. He's not just saying that God's just going to do it all for us. He's saying that we must engage, we must resist, we must at times put practical things in place to ensure we're not going to be in the places we shouldn't be, doing the things that we know dishonour God and crush our passion and our joy for Jesus Christ. Put in practical things to discipline ourselves so that we might glorify our God and be free as he wishes us to be, free from the sins that entangle us. Resist him. But you know, the second half of this verse is really interesting where it says, same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know, there's never been a time when the world feels a collective sense of suffering, perhaps, as now. Maybe in, the, in wartime would be the, another time. But across the whole globe, because of the media that we have now, we all feel a sense of connectedness that we're all going through a similar thing. But what Peter writes into here is the fact that since the beginning of, of the church, there's never been a time where Christians have not been persecuted, where they've not been ostracized, kidnapped, tortured and killed, where the church has not been uh, hated by people who don't want anything to do with our God. It's worth remembering in times of suffering as we're going through now, that we also must remember our brothers and sisters who are going through even more suffering. Perhaps not even just having to worry about COVID-19, but they're also having to worry about where they're going to meet to worship our Lord. The fact that the authorities are looking for them, that they can't be found with a Bible, that they can't speak the words of Jesus Christ. They can never meet in a building like this and praise as loudly as we often do each Sunday. That's the case that it's always been. He's a sobering reminder to us that when one, one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And we might feel like that now across the world. But let's not forget, this has always been the case for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Let us lift up our brothers and sisters who are suffering at this time. Not just because of the pandemic that's going on, but for their faith, for following after Jesus Christ. Let us remember them in our prayers. He then goes on, and this is a word for all who are suffering. Now in verse 10, he says, And after you have suffered a little while, just to pause there, you know, in the light of eternity, even the longest days of lockdown, of isolation, will seem like a blink of an eye compared to eternity with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, and get ready for some fireworks here, friends, that you should not forget, will restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you will restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, for Peter, his desire, I said at the beginning, is that his readers don't forget what he wrote. And it's mine as well. Verse 12 writes this, By Silvanus, a faithful, faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Peter's basically saying there that this letter that I've written to you, this is true grace of God. So stand firm in it. Everything you just read, don't forget it. Stand in it. That's why elsewhere in scripture says that God's word is suitable for teaching at all, th all times. It is good for teaching us right now as well. Let me finish by just reminding ourselves of what this letter has told us about standing firm in. A little bit of a recap across the week. So if you weren't here, uh, this is what we've kind of been looking at. We need to stand firm, knowing that while we might lose our earthly possessions, we cannot lose our identity in Christ or a certain future set apart by our Father, filled by the Holy Spirit and commissioned by Christ. We know where we are heading. We stand firm with a certainty that not one second of our, su of our suffering is meaningless. Or wasted. It is working for our good, for our joy, and for God's glory. He uses it all, all the millions of reasons that we can't see. But we trust our God because He loves us, and we know that because of what Jesus has done for us. We stand firm knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ stood on this very planet as we do, suffered and was tempted in the same way we are. He understands what we're going through, He understands our suffering, and He stands with us in it. He has blazed a path for us to follow. May we look to his steps. We stand firm knowing that if we suffer for doing good, we will be blessed. 
We stand firm knowing that as we share in Christ's sufferings, there is a certainty that we are one of his children. If, we, if he suffered, we shouldn't be surprised that we will as well. We stand firm by humbling ourselves, that we briefly looked at this morning, humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand, knowing that he will lift us up and exalt us in his time. Stand firm in God's grace. Friends, I want to take some time to reflect upon what we've heard throughout the whole series and what we've heard this morning. I really pray that it is spoken to you and that you've heard from, from God this morning. If you're able to perhaps close your eyes and think for a few moments upon the things that God has pressed upon your heart. I'm going to take a few moments of, uh, of quiet and there'll be some, some music in the background and we're just going to reflect over perhaps what we've heard this morning. And then to bring that to an end, I'm going to read something that I've read before at church um, from the front, but it, to me it speaks about standing firm in God's grace. Um, I'm going to read this, this letter that was written by a Zimbabwean pastor who was martyred for the faith. I'm going to read that. But before we do that, I want to take some time to just reflect, to reflect on what are you standing on? Are you standing firm in God's grace? I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colourless dreams, small giving and small goals. I'm no longer, I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits or popularity. I now live by presence, lean by faith love by patience, lift by prayer and labour by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide reliable, my mission clear, I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, diluted or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until all know and work until he comes. And when he comes to get me, his very own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Amen. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through
darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within shall come with trumpet sound who oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne when he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone For the stand before the throne Christ a great song that fits really well with that really declarative section of Andy's talk just then about standing firm in God's grace. We're going to sing Christ is enough for me. Christ is my reward and all my devotion And there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy Through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ 
Christ my only and all The joy of my salvation And this hope will never fail Heaven is our home Through every storm My soul will sing Jesus is here To God be the glory Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back The cross, the cross before me The world behind me No turning back, no turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back, no turning back The cross, the cross before me The world behind me No turning back no turning back, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Oh, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in Lord, you are enough. You are enough for us. Lord, you are more than enough for us. Lord, we thank you for your cross. Lord, we thank you for your love displayed to us. Lord, we thank you that there is nothing that we could ever do to add to what you've done for us. There's nothing that we could ever do to take away from what you've done for us, Lord. Hallelujah. And Lord, we thank you for your grace displayed to us. And so, Lord, with the cross before us and with the world behind us, help us to stand firm on your grace, trusting in Christ alone and in what he has done for us. For your glory, Lord. Amen. And being with us this morning, uh, please do sub please do subscribe um, and like the video. And we also um, have a church Facebook page, which is updated on a regular basis. Alright, there are a few online events going on through the week. Uh, Stretch yeah. will be trying in a new evening format on Zoom with a Q and A session uh, for interaction. The link for this is going to be sent out to everyone on the church database. If you're not on it, please get in touch with church uh, at your convenience. We're going to be having another prayer meeting on Thursday. 
Uh, we had one last week and there were 70 people on. Uh, it was really a powerful and great time of prayer. There was um, breakout sessions that made it even more interactive and I believe there's going to be lots of testimonies coming from that. So please join us again for an hour at 7.30 on Thursday. Um, if you give um, regularly, we really appreciate your giving um, because it's enabling us to be church in this um, season. Um, and if you'd like to give us part of your worship, please go to www.hadelem.org.uk forward slash giving for more details. Please do keep safe, um, keep connect, stay connected and with them um, with distance socializing and if you've got any questions please do contact the office via email or phone or facebook wish you all a lovely and blessed week goodbye from us Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.